God is good, isn't he? How many saw that movie, God is not dead? God is good. And all the time. Amen. He is. He's not dead. He's alive. And he's alive in your hearts this morning, right? Everybody good? Man, good looking crowd here this morning. Thank you. Let me see, let me see you. Yeah, y'all looking good. Good crowd, good, good uh, people. I mean, there's some good people and some bad people, I guess. I mean, just give, I mean, everything, just the whole upstairs is getting full. Amen. So invite a friend to come with you. We believe that uh, anything that's healthy should be growing, it should be thriving. And uh, we believe our church is a place where you can do that, where you can come and just feel Jesus and plant your family here and just grow and get into the Word of God. That's what we're going to do here in just a minute. Amen. We're going to get into the Word of God. But before we do that, I got a joke. I wrote it down. I got it on. It's not from the heart this morning. It's uh, actually more reading this morning. Okay, Let's start with something. Now, when you do it, turn with me to the book of Luke and Luke the fourth chapter. Go to Luke chapter four. And uh, there's a young woman teacher with an obvious liberal tendency to explain to her class of small children that she was an atheist. She asked her class if they were atheists too, not really knowing what atheism was wanted to be like their teacher, their hands exploded into the air. There was, however, one exception. One beautiful uh, one uh, beautiful girl named Lucy who did not go along with the crowd. The teacher asked her why she decided to be different. She said, because I'm not an atheist. The teacher asked her, well, what are you? She said, I'm a Christian. The, uh, uh, the teacher was a bit perturbed. And asked her, Lucy, why she was a Christian. She said, well, I was brought up knowing and loving Jesus. My mom is a Christian and my dad is a Christian. So I'm a Christian. The teacher started to get angry. And she said, that's no reason to be a Christian. What if your mom was a moron and your dad was a moron? What would you be then? She paused and smiled. Then she said, I would be an atheist. <laughs> Praise God. The problem, I mean, uh, uh, Luke, the fourth chapter, Luke chapter four, we see Jesus just coming out of the wilderness here. And, uh, he has been tempted in three different areas of his life. And uh, he, uh, the Bible says, comes out of this wilderness experience full of the spirit and with power. He comes out of his trying moment. He passes the test uh, of flesh uh, and he is now uh, being ministered to by an angel, and God brings him into his ministry. And he walks into the synagogue, and as a custom there, he begins to read. And um, the, 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 he gets he the uh, book of Isaiah, and he begins to read in verse number 18, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. It's Isaiah chapter 61 that he was actually reading from. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down, and the eyes of them were uh, in the synagogues were fasting, fastened upon him. And he began to say to them, This day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? And all bear witness, and they wonder at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Father, we pray this morning that you would give us words to speak that, Lord, man can't gain, say, or resist. I pray, Holy Spirit, will you come and give us that unction, that anointing that destroys yokes this morning. We pray, God, open every ear to uh, every person that's under the sound of our voice, and I pray the anointing, dear God, would be evident, Lord, that you would inscribe upon our hearts your word that we might not sin against you. Show us what needs to be uh, shown by your spirit. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. We see as Jesus was in the synagogue, and he was uh, quoting Isaiah. He said there were several things that he had been assigned to do, that he was anointed to do. The Spirit of God was on him for these reasons. One was to preach the gospel, the good news, to those who needed a hope and help 
in, in this life. That's what he was sent to do. The Bible is clear what he said his mission was. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we know that he did that. He shed his blood on the cross. Um, but being the propitiation between God and man so that we could have an advocate, so that we wouldn't have to suffer sin and death as we uh, know it uh, or they knew it as then. But we would have uh, remission for our sins for what he did. And then he goes on, he says something which I want to draw uh, attention to this morning. We could take and probably uh, preach a whole series just off of this one, uh, one passage this morning. There's several things that Jesus did do. But I want to focus in this morning on the second thing that Jesus said that I was anointed to do. And he said, I've come to heal the broken hearted. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning is about the healing of the broken heart. How many's ever had a heartbreak? How many's ever been broken hearted? You probably go back to maybe the first grade, probably when they were handing out, uh, you know, the little Valentine things, the little cards, and maybe you didn't get one from somebody you thought that you should have gotten one from. And you, you've probably experienced heartbreak all through your life of different sorts and different things. Uh, last week, we talked about experiencing setbacks or how to deal with setbacks in our life, how to overcome things that catch us at unaware and dealing with the offended spirit or the broken heart, if you will. So I believe that, that uh, uh, Proverbs is clear. Proverbs, the fourth chapter, he tells us that we uh, 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 have a heart. We have a heart that God has given us and we are to guard our heart because out of the heart, uh, flow the issues of life. Everything comes from the heart. So this morning, that's what we're going to be dealing with. We're going to talk about the heart. Uh, I believe that God wants us to make sure that our heart is right with Him. Somebody say amen. amen. But the enemy knows how to come in and he knows how to try to damage or how to pollute or how to break our hearts. And because of that, it causes depression or oppression or, you know, we get into mully grubs and we get down because uh, somebody done us wrong or somebody said something to us that, that uh, made us cry, dealt with our emotions. Ladies and gentlemen, there's going to happen. You heard me say that last week that your chances of having a broken heart or your chances of being offended are 100%. Jesus said it uh, in John chapter 4. He says that it is impossible that you walk through this life without offense. Offenses are going to come. Were you going to be offended at some point in your life? Or are you going to uh, cause an offense some, in, in, to someone in your life? But he said, woe be to the one who causes offenses. So I want you to go ahead and get it down in your mind. Go ahead and just put it down in your spirit that there's going to be somebody that's going to do me wrong. In this life, there's going to be somebody that's going to offend me. Somebody's going to do something to me that I hate, that I loathe, that I despise, that I don't uh, agree with. And because of that, it's going to cause an offense to come to me. Look here. Just because offenses come does not mean that we have to die with that offense. It does not mean that that offense has to conquer and control our destiny. It's going to come. But we have to prepare ourselves the best that we know how to overcome the offenses that will come our way. So when they do come, we prepare ourselves. We learn how to respond to the adversity that has been given to us. We don't allow other things or circumstances to control us, but we allow the Spirit of God to arise on the inside of us and say, because of what He's done on the inside of me, I can overcome this tragedy. I can overcome this offense that's happened to me. I'm not going to sit around and sit around and just do nothing, but I will arise and I'm going to go forward. But the first, second, second Corinthians 4, 17 tells us this, for our light affliction is but for a moment. It works for us for a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The things that, are, uh, that we see right now are temporal, but the things which are not seen, the Bible said, are eternal things. So get your eyes off of the things that are, are holding you back right now, that have hurt you right now, and let's get through those things, and let's not wallow in the mire and wallow in the mud and feel sorry for ourselves. Somebody say amen. amen. My grandmother used to sing a song all the time. Y'all probably heard me sing it a time or two, haven't you? Amen. How many of you ever felt sorry for yourself? Because somebody walked out on you. Somebody broke your heart. 
Somebody left you holding the bag. You got fired, or, or you got falsely accused, or you, uh, you know, uh, you know, you didn't get the promotion, you didn't get the job or the raise that everybody else got, and because of that, it hurt your feelings. And so you walk away feeling like, man, I, I'm, you know, I've been attacked, and I'm, I'm wrong. How many ever felt like that? And so you go and you feel unjust, or you feel like, uh, you know, you're sad. And so you get out that big, long rubber arm and you stretch it way back there behind you and you begin to pat yourself on the back and you begin to say, woe is me. Amen. My grandmother's song was, I'm going to the garden to eat worms. Big, fat, juicy ones, little, bitty, skinny ones, golly, how they squirm. I'm going to the garden to eat worms. Now you can tell I'm not a singer, right? Neither was she. <laughs> But it's a, it's a pity party. And, and let me tell you what, it's natural sometimes for our flesh, because we have been hurt, because we have been wounded, to get into a pity party and get into a place to where we feel sorry for ourselves and we're the only ones going through what we're going through. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what, there might be a time to weep, there's a time to feel sorry for yourself, there's a time to mourn, there's a time to grieve, but there's a time also that you get yourself up from there and you encourage yourself in the Lord, you pull yourself up by the boot straps and say, hey, I may be down for a minute, but let me tell you what, don't count me out because Jesus is on my side. And if God be for me, come on, who can be against me? You get up from that place. Amen. But the broken heart is uh, something that we uh, need to contend with. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse number 23, he says, for out of the heart flows every issue of life. Now, when we talk about the heart this morning, we're not talking about the blood pumping organ that pumps blood through your veins. It's not your blood pumping muscle that we're referring to. Uh, the heart is, is uh, meaning uh, the, the uh, seat of feelings or your emotions, the intellect. The Bible talks about the heart being the center of everything. It's the heart uh, that is my appetites. Appetite. It seems to be the synonym for the human spirit. So when we talk about the heart this morning, we're talking about the human spirit. The heart is the knowing faculty. It, it, it you know, it's it's what know. It has knowledge of. The Bible refers to it as that we pray with our heart, we meditate with our heart, we think with our heart, ponder with our heart, we believe unto salvation with our with our heart. Primarily, it's the issues that know. Also, the heart is uh, the center of your feelings. It's not only the knowing, it's the, it's the intellect, but it's also the, uh, the center of your feelings. The Bible refers to the heart as being a glad heart or having a loving heart, a fearful heart, a courageous heart, a grieving heart, angry heart, excited heart. So primarily, the, uh, it involves the inner feelings of a person. So this morning when I talk about having a broken heart, it's not your blood pumping muscle. You ever heard me say, I love you with all my heart. Well, that's just one organ. If you really wanted to just emphasize, I love you with both my kidneys. I love you with both my love. But look, that's not that. It's the heart. It's the ceiling of your, the seat of your feelings and your emotions. It's, it's your knowing what you know. Going with what you know that's in your heart or, or feeling what's in your heart that really is concerned. And so God tells us in Proverbs, He said, be diligent. Number one, be diligent to guard your heart. We need a heart that's protected. A heart that God wants us to cover. There's some people in this room this morning and just in life in general knowing that you are more sensitive to certain areas than others. Maybe your heart is more tender than other people's hearts. The Bible talks about having a hardened heart after a period of time, after it's been, uh, you know, <laughs> abused and after it's been used, after it's gone through a process, the heart tends to be hardened. But some of you are still tender and you're, you're still soft. You're, your heart's still susceptible to, to feelings and emotions. And somebody can just say something just little and it can break your heart and cause your emotions to fly off a handle. Look, if you know that you're that type of person, then there needs to be a 
staffing. There needs to be a protection there of your heart, knowing that, hey, I've got to guard my heart. Why? Because out of my heart comes every issue of life. It's the center of everything that I do. If my heart is broken, if my heart is broken, then I can't be good to anybody else. Because how do we minister to other people? How do we minister to the Lord? How do we even minister to ourselves? We minister through our spirit. Our human spirit ministers to the Lord. And if our heart is broken, that means that it's not working the way it's supposed to work. See, when the heart is broken, it don't necessarily mean that you're walking around crying and mourning and, and, and you're in tears all the time. When something is broken, it means it's just not operating and functioning the way it's supposed to function. It's out of order. If you go to a public restroom and you see a sign on the door that says, out of order. You know what that means? That means something in there that was designed to work a certain way, that was engineered to be a certain way, is no longer functioning the way that it was intended to function. Something is not right. It's broken. And therefore, it can't, it can't do what it was assigned to do. See, when we have a broken spirit, it's the same thing. There's a sign that goes over our human spirit that says we are not functioning the way that we're supposed to function. We're not operating in the anointing in which God has called us to walk in. Is somebody with me this morning? We are out of order. We can't effectively minister to God. We can't effectively minister to people. We can't even effectively minister ourselves. Why? Because our spirit and our heart has been broken. If I was the enemy, that's what the very thing I would go after. I would go after the very center of your life. I would try to destroy the main part of what you are about. I would mess up what you're trying to do, what your, what your assignment is for the Lord. And that's exactly what the enemy has done. I want you to hear me this morning. The enemy is not after your, he's not just after your body. Oh, he'll try to destroy your body. But let me tell you what he's after. He's after your spirit. He's trying to affect your heart. That's why he's allowing things or he's sending things and shooting arrows to make you offended. If you can get offended, if you can have your heart broken, then you're not thinking about things of, of what God wants you to be thinking about. You're not worried about winning the world and winning your community and winning your lost neighbor. Your eyes are on you. Your eyes are saying, if I can just make it through the day, I'll be all right. If I can just make it one more step, I'll be okay. And so your primary focus becomes on me and what I'm doing. Why? Because I'm broken. That's not what God has called and assigned us and ordained us to do. He's called us to be what He was. To seek and to save that which was lost. To come and bind up the brokenhearted. And that's what our assignment is. But the enemy has thrown darts to break your heart. He's called somebody to offend you. He's called somebody to say something to you that makes you mad. That upsets you. That caused you to feel the way you feel. Oh, don't look all pious and all sanctimonious to me. Because let me tell you what, if we had a hidden camera, some of you probably almost cussed coming to church this morning. <laughs> and really, maybe some of you did cuss coming to church this morning. Maybe things didn't go your way. And maybe somebody, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Is that the truth? Let me tell you, sometimes people can do stuff to ruffle your feathers. I mean, no, the devil is after your heart. He's trying to offend you. Have you ever had anybody to lie on you? Some of it was true, but they told it. A lot of it was a lie. Most of it was a lie. I've had people uh, falsely accuse me before. Have you had anybody just say something about you that just made you upset, that offended you? Well, look, the word offend that we're talking about in the Word of God, where offenses will surely come. Look, it's not just something that just breaks your heart or feeds your spirit, but it causes you to stumble. It's the, the word that comes from a Latin word that means scandalous. It means to, to, for you to get involved with emotions and with flesh that would cause your spirit man to go away from God. And see, that's what happens is the enemy is doing everything he can do to get into your emotions and into your mind and to your feelings and to your intellect so that he can get you away from God. 
Are y'all following me? Away from what God has intended you to do. To get in the flesh. To get, you know, out of the spirit. <laughs> and so he attacks your spirit, man. Somebody say amen. He attacks your heart. He's after your heart. He wants you to respond to uh, the flesh. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Our warfare is not of the flesh. Our warfare is in the spirit. And so I have to guard my heart with spiritual things. i got to know that the enemy is after, after. And I've got to respond that way. Somebody slaps you on one side of the cheek, Jesus said. He said, don't respond in the flesh. He said, offer him the other side. Pow. Give him the other side to hit you also. He said, you know, if somebody does you wrong, he said, love those and bless those who despitefully use you and do you wrong. See, you know, when, when someone does you wrong, he said, if you'll show them love instead of responding the way you really wanted to respond, it's like keeping coals of fire on their head. And, and, and let me tell you what, in the end, if you'll be the one that's humbled, if you'll be the one who does the right thing, if you'll be the one who says, okay, God, I'll take this because you sent it my way. And I'm going to deal with the adverse. I'm going to deal with the broken heart the right way. Let me tell you what. God will advance you and promote you. But if you do it your way, if you do it flesh way, then you'll reap the havoc that it causes. And you will not have life and peace like Romans says. Are you with me? Say amen. All right. I feel like I'm losing. The heart is, is the seed of your feelings. It's the seed of your emotions. It's what you know. It's what you feel. And it's got to be protected at all costs. Because if you don't, the enemy is going to come in and he's going to try to uh, wage war on that. So number two, the way God wants us uh, not only to have a protected heart, but God also wants us to have a pure heart. It's important that our heart is pure. Somebody say Amen. There's a lot out there to defile the heart. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 8, on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, verse number 8. He said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, religion can't replace the heart of a man. You can do a lot of good things without a right heart for God. There's a lot of people who do a lot of good deeds. I mean, they, they, they really do. They feed the poor. I mean, they're doing just about what Jesus said he was sent here to do. You know, they're taking care of, uh, you know, the, the, the widows. Uh, there, there's organizations out there that, that take care of, of, of unwed uh, mothers. Who, uh, there's people who are taking uh, uh, babies and adopting them. Uh, great things. Ministering healing. To a lot of people, a lot of great organizations out there that are doing a lot of good things. Let me tell you what, it does not replace the heart of the matter. God is not looking at your religious deeds and your good deeds as much as he is as he's looking on the heart. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, but God inspects and examines and looks on the heart of man. What's your motive? What's your heart like? Is your heart right with God? Is your feelings, is your emotions all about Jesus? Is what you're doing for the right reasons? Or, or you know, is your heart consumed by God? It's the heart that God is looking for. David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. He was a man that had a heart that was right for God. He was doing the right things. Other people in the Bible, we see that they did a lot of things, but their heart was evil. And God judges an evil heart. Matter of fact, Jeremiah said it this way. He said, in the heart, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's I mean, it's evil. Out of it flow adultery and fornication and lying and, and murder is in the heart. The heart of man is wicked. Matter of fact, that's why God flooded the earth. Uh, uh, with water because the heart of man was wicked. He said, it repents me that I even made man because look at the evil that's in the heart of man. The heart is evil. 
But the heart has to be regenerated. It has to be renewed. That's why when you get saved, you don't give God just your mind. You give Him your heart. See, you give Him the center of all you are. Either He's Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. God says, I want your heart. Don't just give me what you want me to have. Don't just give me your little pet sins and the things that you think are just messing up your life. No, I want everything. You I want the center of who you are. Yeah. Give me your heart. Yeah. And when you give him your heart, listen, that heart has been purified. That heart is regenerated. That heart is renewed. He said, I'll put a new heart inside of you. See, without a new heart, then you're just going to be the same old person dressed up in a different way. You put us, you can get a pig. And you can get that old hog and you can wash him down and clean him up. You can even put toenail polish on it. You can put a nice bow ribbon on I mean, you can have it ready to show. Let me tell you what. You turn that hog loose around some mud. You know what? He's going back to the hog pen. He's going back to the to the sw the, the wall. Not the swallow, not me to swallow. <laughs> he goes back, you know why? Because he's still a pig. See? You, you see, what, what we do now is you got to understand, a lot of times we can bring people into church and we can give them a big Bible and we can let them go through a class and we can make sure that they're members and they sign all the right paperwork so that they can vote at the election. And you know what? You know what? You turn them loose in this world, they're going to go right back to sinning and they've never changed because the heart has not changed. The heart has to change. The heart has to be pure. My mother, it don't mean that you will be perfect just because God has changed your heart. It does not mean that you will not be without sin. You'll sin. You'll mess up. You'll blow it. There'll be times where you don't, you, your heart's not pure. But that's where we can go to the cross and we can allow Jesus to forgive us and give us a new heart and say, Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. Purify my heart. David did. David was a man after God's heart, but he sinned with Bathsheba, killed Uriah, the Hittite, and he did a lot of evil things. But we hear his prayer in Psalms 51. Oh, God, create in me a clean heart. Oh, God, renew a right spirit within me. I blew it. If you've blown it this morning and if you've lost it and your heart's not pure, that's all you've got to do is cry out to God and say, Oh, God, cleanse my heart. He'll purify your heart. He'll cleanse you and make you new again. Somebody ought to be shouting for the victory because you know that you need a purified heart this morning. Jesus has provided that for you. You ought to just give him glory that he's done that for you. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. Just because you've blown it, just because you messed up, don't mean that you can't have a pure heart. God can forgive you this morning. That's what I want you to do this morning. I want you to be thinking about it. i got one more point. But your heart needs to be protected. I need to guard my heart. Let, 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 me, let me just say this right here. Girls, guys are like, but girls, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Don't give your heart to so any old guy just because he says, I love you. I love you, baby. Guard your heart. And, you know, love, that's, that works strong around so loosely, isn't it? Oh, I love you. You love me I, like I love you. And you will. Shut up. Can, can I just, can I do some um, youth pastoring real quick? You go on a date, girls, real quick. Let me tell you what. You just take your Bible. Not your phone. Get the big one off the coffee table at your grandma's house. <laughs> Might be great grandma now. I don't know. Get that big one. You know, it's got the pictures in it. You go on a date. Let me tell you what. If he don't open the car door, if he pulls up and he don't, you know, he's got to come inside and meet your parents first, right? He's got to knock on the door. But, but look, if he don't open the door for you, just turn around going back in the house. Just do that, all right? Just do it. He gets in on that side and he's just standing there and he don't get it. Just go on in the house. He asks, what you doing? Say, what are you doing? If I don't have any more respect than that, then I'm not even going to go on a date with you. But if he does, open the door for you. Get in there. Lay that big old book, that Bible, in between you and him. And just always, you know, I like to pray before we go anywhere. 
and just start speaking in tongues. <laughs> You'll know whether he really wants you or he wants. <laughs> but lay that Bible down through there. Let me tell you what, he'll have to climb over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to you. Somebody say amen. All right? One of them. Look, if he does climb over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give him Acts. <laughs> then he'll have a revelation. And if he still don't get it, there's some maps in here in the back. Just to get the road, Jack. Come on, somebody. Come back. That's why I give the Lord a praise. Look. Look, there's a lot of selfish people out there that don't mind breaking your heart just to get what they want. It, it, look, there's, that's the reason people are breaking other people's hearts because of pride. Because I want to be right and I'm going to do whatever I got to do to cut you and stab you and push you down so that I can shine. It's selfishness. It's pride. Without pride, there could be no contention. There could be no uh, fight going on. So understand, there are some enemies out there that you've got to guard your, protect your heart from. And you've got to make sure that if the enemy does get in and you do give in to your, your, your flesh and you have uh, sinned against God, someone, know that God will purify your heart. But this last one is where I really wanted to get this morning. I believe that you ought to have a preserving heart. A persevering heart. A heart that's committed to the Lord. A heart that's undivided. A heart that's uncompromising. A heart that's determined to win. I call it the heart of a champion. A heart that will not quit, even though it gets hit. Go with me to Acts chapter 28. This is where I'm closing. Acts 28. Mm. Acts 28. This is good, right? Lord help me. I'm going to get me some of this walla <clears throat> while you're turning to Acts 28. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever been bitten? You shake your head. What have you, what have you been bitten by? A dog? Where have you been bitten by a dog? Have you ever been bitten by a cat? I hate cats. <laughs> I just want to tell you right now, there's no cat heaven. <laughs> I know you cat lovers, don't, don't even talk to me about it, because I, I, you're not going to convince me. A dog, he wags his tail, you know, he, he's, I mean, the, you know, is it in the Bible or is it? A uh, man, dog is man's best friend. <laughs> That's not scriptural. That's the NIV version. She, but cat, she don't ever know what they're thinking. They might rub up against you. And they say, you know, bite you. <laughs> <laughs> we had one that was we had the backyard. And Rhonda was there, and he's rubbing all against her, and all of a sudden he bites her. She turns around, and he bites her on the back of the leg. Knock him in the head with a piece of firewood or something like that. Like, oh, poor little kittens. I, don't, I like kittens. The bad part is they grow up to be cats. <laughs> They've been bitten, bitten by a dog. I remember I was standing, I was door to door salesman. Uh, I was working for a company and I, I walked up and, you know, we, they teach you to rattle the gate. You rattle the gate. And no dogs come out, you're pretty safe. You gotta wait just a few minutes to see if there's any dogs. Kind of look around if there's any evidence of dogs. So this one time I rattled the gate, you know, and no dog. So I walk up to the front porch and, and it was just a single stair and it had um, you know some railing around it, just one one door there, and I knock on the door. I hear a dog growling behind me. I turned around and there's a dumb pincher. Oh, He's standing there right at the foot of that step. And he wasn't playing. <laughs> so I <laughs> started knocking even more. I hear dogs inside. <laughs> and I go, oh, Lord, dogs are everywhere. I just knew I was fixing to get bit, bitten. Well, the long story is, 
uh, I had to go back and uh, pay for some flowers. <laughs> the fern and another flower. Uh, the dog was hit to go. And all I had, Robbie, was I grabbed a, I grabbed a fern and a big flower pot, and uh, that dog was trying to bite me. <laughs> Doing like that, and I was, he was trying to bite everything. And I ran, took off, jumped in the back of the truck, had to go over the top of the hood, down through my truck to get in because he was, he was after me. He would have, he would have bitten me. Uh, any postman in the house? Taylor was a UPS man. You ever been bitten by a dog, Taylor? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Been How many of you ever been bitten by a snake? Where are you at, Lynn? <laughs> Lynn's up there, up there. You ever been bitten by a snake? A venomous snake? Never been. Anybody ever been bitten by a venomous snake? Like a rattlesnake or a, a moccasin? Or a, a, what's another venomous snake, Jerry? What's another one? Copperhead, what's another one? Coral snake? What's the dangerous ones in Africa? What are they? Black mumba. <laughs> I didn't I can't even say it. Oh, I don't like snakes. How many don't like snakes? I hate snakes worse than I hate cats. Cats and snakes are to go live together. <laughs> Hallelujah. You ever been bitten? It's not fun to be bitten, is it? By anything, even if it's poisonous or non-poisonous. I'm gonna show you something to Paul. Watch Paul in verse number one, verse 28. Paul, he just comes off of a shipwreck. The angel of the Lord comes and stands beside him and says to everybody that's on the ship, says, look here, if y'all stay with me, uh, you will uh, probably go suffer when the ship's gonna be destroyed. But let me tell you what, if you'll stay with me, and the angel of the Lord told me that I've, I've gotta go preach somewhere, so I'm gonna be saved. I'm just telling you right now that I'm going to be okay. The ship's destroyed. They end up on this island of Malta here, and they they are uh, they are uh, uh, you know wet. They're cold. Uh, the 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 natives were not being very nice to them, but they did let them build a fire. Here's where we start. It says that when they were escaped, when they, they knew they were at the island which is called Malta, uh, a barbarous people showed us no kindness, for they were. Uh, for they kindled a fire and they received every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, laid them on a fire, there came out a viper of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw that the venomous beast hanged on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though they had escaped to see, even vengeance suffers not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and, and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked, howbeit when they looked, when they should, when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked, I'm going to draw a point here, I want you to know. After they had looked a great while, they saw, everybody say no harm. They saw no harm come to him and they changed their minds and they said he was a god. Now, we'll show you. Here he is, he's putting wood on the fire, and all of a sudden, this venomous snake, I mean, a black mumba, <laughs> whatever it is, whoop, grabs a hold of his hand, and he shook it off. It's hanging on him now. I mean, he suffers the bite. I mean, he, it's on him. Boom, he throws it. He had to have hurt. He had snake teeth in him, hanging on. And he shook it off in the fire, and the natives were watching him, and he said, Surely he, he, he sinned against his God or something and he's fixed to die. He should swell up any minute and we're fixed to go bury him because we know about these snakes. We know that if anybody suffers a bite like that, that, you know, it's going to surely put them out of commission. But after they looked a little while and they kept watching, they, they noticed nothing happened to him. And because of that, the Bible says they changed their minds about what they had previously believed. Now I'm going somewhere. I want you to follow. Just because you're a Christian and you're in this life and you're saved, you're sanctified, your foot's on the rock, your mind's made up, your eyes fixed, forehead, and all those good things, and man, you are just a loving, full life, does not mean that you won't be bitten. 
See, see, there's a gospel that's going around right now, and I don't believe it's all the gospel. It's part of the gospel where you're prosperous and you're healthy and you're and you're going from mountaintop to mountaintop and going from blessing to blessing and God's favor is on your life. You're walking in the fog. Favor God. You know, and that's true, that's true. There, there's, there place, there's a place. But let me tell you, holistically, everything that you've got to look at, there are going to be times and seasons in your life where it don't seem like you're walking in the favor and you're not uh, prospering and advancing at that moment. You're in the worst trial of your life. And the enemy has bitten you. And he has bitten you on the hand. And everyone sees it. See, it's one thing, you got to hear me, it's one thing to be bitten privately. It's one thing for somebody to call you up privately and, and, and blast you out. Or it's, 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 it's one thing that you're dealing with a situation at your own home privately where nobody, but when you're, when you're bitten publicly, it puts another spin on it, don't it? Everybody is watching you. Let me tell you what, there are going to be times where you're bitten privately and there's going to be times where you're bitten publicly. Does that mean God is not who He said He was? Oh, absolutely not. Matter of fact, He may allow you to get bitten publicly so that the barbarians, so the people that don't believe like you believe, can see that there's more power. Oh, come on, somebody say amen. That there's power in what you've got. See, there's some people that don't believe in the power of God. They've never been exposed to it. And so, therefore, they don't know about it. Is all they know is what they know. Is all they know is going to church and singing a few hymns. And all they know is just going and just checking the box and going to church and being good, little goody two-shoes kind of people. They've never experienced the power of God. But let me tell you what, God will allow you to be exposed to the power of God. He will initiate it. And you know sometimes how He initiates it? He initiates it through other people who are being bitten by snakes, by vipers. You may, and I may, have been ones that have been chosen to be bitten publicly. Because you know what? The people that have never experienced the real of God need to see somebody that's got the real deal flowing in their veins. Oh, don't it make you sick to see hypocrisy? Don't it make you sick to see people who claim the name and just a little bit of, just a little bit of, uh, opposition comes their way and they're right back to drinking and right back to drugging and right back to carousing around. Just a little bit of opposition throws them in a tailspin. Oh, but just two weeks ago they were baptized. Just two weeks ago they were making a commitment to Christ. And two weeks ago they were speaking in tongues. But now, now just a little bit of opposition. There they are right back in the world and there's been no change. See, see, you know what? The barbarian, the people that don't understand that are looking and saying, I've got as much as you got. Why would I want to change? Why would I want to come to church? Why would I want to serve your God? You don't have anything. But I'm talking about those that have endured some hardships, that have been bitten and have the snake hanging from their hand that shakes it off into the fire and no harm comes to them. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those that go through chemo and we're still standing, baby. Come on, those that have walked through the divorce and you've made and you started over and you are still standing, baby. Come on, you are still walking with God, even though everybody turned their back on you. You lost your job. They took the car. They foreclosed on the house. I'm still here. I'm still here. Why? Because I've got something that's more than religion. I've got something down on the inside. It's a renewed heart. It's a renewed spirit. And it's God that put it on the inside of me. And let me tell you what. The world needs to see some real people. They need to see some people who says, I am not going to quit. I'm going to persevere. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to walk away. Why? Because I've got something worth fighting for. A persevering heart. Oh, you might have bit me. 
Oh, you might have hung on me for a little while. And everybody saw it. But I'm still standing. I'm still standing. God will allow you to go through some things. So others can see someone who is for real. Not the phony. Not the religious people. Who cave in and quit at every little whim. Who throw in the towel on the black side for every little reason. But because you got bit, you shook it off. It says something to those on the outside. And it makes them hungry for what you got. It makes them hunger and say, you know what? I changed my mind about you. I thought you was just like everybody else. I thought you was like old Joe at the shipyard. Every other month, he's religious. Every other year or so, yeah, he gets salvation. And then we see him in Barry. I thought you was just like everybody else. But you know what? I've been watching you. I've been having my eyes on you. And you know what? You've been consistent for all this time. I saw how people treated you. I saw how people, I saw them bite you. You just shut it off. I want what you got. I want what you possess in your heart. It says they changed their minds. About who he was. I don't know about you. Man. I want a heart that's preserved. I want a heart that says that people can look at and say, he might not be perfect. He might have some flaws. He might have some things going on with him. God's not finished with him yet, but you know what? He's not easily shaped. He shakes it off. Just keeps on going. The man was tired of his mule. I'm closing right here. Y'all seen me do this before, but some of y'all had it. Feel like I ought to share with you. Got tired of the mule. He was always stubborn. He wouldn't do what he was supposed to do. He wouldn't pull, he wouldn't plow, he would he's just, just being a nuisance. And man, so I tell you what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bury him alive. He don't even deserve to be shot in the head. I ain't gonna waste my bullets. So we went out there, dug him a hole, put that mule down inside that hole. Started getting dark, he started covering him up. Sorry, mule. We'll pull, we'll plow, it'll we'll do right. He's throwing that dirt on that mule's back. Every shovel land on his back. Oh, you will shake it off. Put it under his feet. Oh, you just constantly covered him up. There is mute alive. Every shovel full landed on his back. Y'all help me. He shook it off. Put it under his feet. That dirt just kept coming on him. Coming all over him. Every time he'd get on his back, he would. Don't make me come down there. <laughs> Every dirt would come on his back, he would. Put it under his feet. After the man got to the last shovel of dirt, he realized the mule was standing right beside him. <laughs> you know why? Because with every pile of dirt that got on him, he. Guess what? The enemy's trying to bury your life. With every shovel of dirt that he throws on your back, you know what you got to do? Because if you allow it to keep consuming you, it will bury your life. It'll eat your lunch. And you'll be just like every, you'll be a statistic. So what I want to say to you, shake it off. Put it under your feet. Okay, okay. I don't know why your mama did what she did. I don't know why your daddy did what he did. I don't know why they walked out on you. And I don't know why your grandparents had to raise you. I don't know why you was accused. And I don't know why you lost a child. I don't know why they left you holding a bag with your children. I, I don't know why you got cancer. I don't know why you're, you're, they didn't, the loved one didn't make it after you. I don't know all those answers. But I do know this one thing. That you can't live with a broken heart the rest of your life. You gotta let God heal you at some point. You gotta let Him restore you. I don't understand. I don't understand all the heart. Let me tell you what the Word of God says. And all these things, they work to the good of those who love the Lord, called according to His purpose. 
I may be cast down, but I'm not destroyed. <clears throat> Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Amen. Amen. Listen, hold on. This morning we're closing with this. We can go to lunch in just a minute, but before we go to lunch, we need to take care of some business. We need to give God just about five minutes of our undevoted, undivided attention. I know you've been sitting there a long time. I've been preaching a long time. But we did this last week, and I want to do it again this week. I want us to take our hurt, our disappointment, our broken hearts, our offended spirits, our trash that we've been carrying, I want you to put it in your hands. And I want you to bring it to the one who can do something about it. It's not me. It's Jesus. Here's my, here's my pain, God. Here's my suffering. Here's what I've been carrying. I'm not designed to carry this. Ma. I'm broken. I need to be fixed. I need to be repaired. So that I can fulfill my assignment that God has for me this morning. I preach my heart to you this morning. I feel like I preached what God told me to preach to you today. Now I need you to respond to what God is asking. He's asking you to bring your trash. Leave it at the altar. Walk away from this place. Heal this morning. Ever been broken? Ever been bitten? Now it's time to be healed. Let the healing, he's got healing in his wings. He said he's the healing balm of Gilead. He's, he's come to bind up the brokenhearted and set at liberty those that are captive. He's come to minister to your brokenness. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to tell me what it is. You don't have to tell nobody what it is. Some of you are married for the second, even third time, and you still carry your garbage. You're still blaming somebody else for where you are right now. You need to go home, go on and give it to Jesus. Some of you are dealing with the loss of a loved one. You need to come on and bring it to Jesus. You're dealing with lost relationships. You need to bring it to Jesus. And let him heal you. This is so he can go far. That's me, Brother Jimbo. I want to do that. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to come. Don't hesitate. I want our worship team to come. And I want you to get out here and let the Spirit of God Take your pain and take your burdens. You do that. <laughs>